Welcome to Positive Talk with Kevin McDonald. Hey, that's me. Hi, and welcome to Positive Talk. Our show features the best positive stories and people from around the globe as we endeavor to answer the universal question of why am I here and what is my purpose? Understanding that can change everything and knowing your greatness is fundamental to living your best life. So join us right now as together we work to create the adventure of our lifetime. I have to tell you, you have no idea how cool it is to be me. <laughs> the last, last hour we spent in the highlands of Scotland talking to a man about fish and stuff, and he's, and, uh, he's met people. Anyway, you'll have to listen to that podcast when it comes up. Um, and in this hour, we are going to Costa Rica because our our guest is uh has a yoga re yoga retreat center down there and we're going to talk about all that and his um he's got a new way of helping you become pain free so if you are um if you've got my um if you've got pain in your body someplace uh yogi aaron can help you by the way his uh his website is yogiaaron.com. But before we go there, I would like to talk to Eric for a moment because it's snowing and or raining or it's doing something of of participation. Uh, uh, it's raining here. Yeah, looking out my window, it's just a little bit of rain. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, we could have a little more snow mixed in. Um, but, you know, it is January, so uh, I guess we're doing all right. It is what it is, and uh, if we make it through, we've got, what's today, uh, the 17th, if we make it through a month and a half, it's then on March, and then it's going to snow one time, and that'll be it, and stuff, so we're good. <laughs> when I look at uh, what the, a lot of the rest of the country is dealing with, I'm very grateful to be here. In it is. I was just talking to a gentleman who's in the highlands of Scotland, and he tells me it's 12 degrees below zero. Ooh, that'll put a chill up your kilt. Yes. <laughs> we actually talked about the science behind the kilts, and um, I dare not go into it, but uh, um, it was a, it was fun. And this is going to be a fun episode as well because we're going to be talking to uh, Yogi Aaron. As a matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and introduce him now? Yogi, how are you today, young man? <laughs> Thank, I'm great. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, Kevin. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more of a pleasure for me to speak to you because you know, <laughs> you know so much more than I do. So, um. <laughs> on, on, on the best of topics, yes. On some topics, yes. <laughs> but um, you seem to be much more well-rounded. I've never gotten into a discussion about uh, what's going on beneath the kilt. So, ooh, that's a good movie title, Beneath the Kilt. <laughs> <laughs> beneath the Kilt. As, as, as a matter of fact, he told me, and I, I, I have no reason to doubt him, but he said that the military guys who wear kilts, when they go off base, they there is a gentleman standing there and there is a mirror on the floor and they double check to make sure each person is appropriately dressed for their kilt which means they ain't got nothing underneath it so, <laughs> i don't know that i'd want that job of of looking up men's kilts kilts all day long but that's you know it's interesting when you start looking around the world and different different uh, customs and what people do is yes. it really is amazing yeah it's fun to have you here young man and i'm i'm so looking forward to it because you know yoga um is a really important aspect and is becoming more and more popular uh, mm -hmm. as as we go because people are recognizing the the value of it and i really love yours because it's like Stop the stretching yoga thing, and we're going to talk about, <laughs> talk about all that. And also, if you have a lot of pain, you've yeah. got a system by which you're working to help people and get out of pain. But first of all, i got to ask you, because somebody's asking me, what does a yogi mean? What does it mean to be a yogi? A yogi is just simply a person who practices yoga. Uh, it's a person who's... I. 
I, it's loosely, it's a person who practices yoga. I think more to the point, it's a person who really endeavors to practice a lifestyle of yoga. What does that mean? I was going <laughs> to. <laughs> you can do that. You, you're a podcaster, so you can do both ends of this. I can, I can, I can. Yoki Aaron, what do you think? Well, I think I could interview myself. Kevin, shut up. I'll take over now. <laughs> well, I'll go have a, I'll go have a scotch in your kilt. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what does it mean to be a practicing yoga? I think in the most simplest, like, you know, uh, kindergarten um, kind of idea of it just simply means to live consciously. Um, you know, it, it's a person who endeavors to be really mindful. And I, but that's like a very, you know, kindergarten simplistic version of it. I think at a deeper level uh it also denotes an idea that you're endeavoring to be come or be or endeavoring to become the best version of yourself it also denotes a person who's who's endeavoring to you know share goodwill into the world and so there's a few kind of figures in life i think that were exemplar exemplar um yogis one of them is gandhi you know, you look at the life of Gandhi, he was a person of action. He was a person of intention. Um, one of the, the book of Gandhi is titled My Experiments with Truth. And so, you know, a more, so I, I gave sort of a kindergarten definition of what it means to be a, a yoga person or what it means to practice yoga. I think on a, on a sort of, master's degree, which is something that most, I would say that 99.9% .9 of yoga people are not doing um, or never taught is that if we're really practicing yoga, we're practicing with what is true and we're conducting experiments with truth. And so Gandhi did that vigilantly. Um, one of those great experiments is very infamous. He experimented with liberate. What would it be like if India was a free country, you know, free from uh, the boot or the heel of the uh, British Empire? And so what he what did he do? He said, I'm going to do an experiment. We're going to march to the ocean and make salt. And we're going to see what happens. <laughs> and that that experiment um, which simple experiment of marching peacefully, it's important to, to, to say that as well, to the sea, then, you know, brought the British Empire to its knees. I mean, just such a simple act. And so yogis are constantly mindful of experimenting with truth, that their life is an experiment, and we're doing that to uncover the essence of who we really are and how we can show up in the world better or better versions of ourselves and that we're more in line with our purpose. Given that now, you, unfortunately my, my, I'm not sure if the opening played properly for you, but I will re go over just a little bit of it, which is, <laughs> which is, I, I believe that, that we are all great. Yes. And you, but you need to know your greatness, mm -hmm. and if you know your greatness, you can then embark upon the adventure of a lifetime to do whatever you choose to do and to be who you really are. Yeah. And I know that you you hold the same philosophy that you can have limitless potential of yeah. who you really are if you are mindful and taking care of yourself in a positive way and doing some of these things. And you, am I close? Yeah, actually, I, I wanted just to ask your permission if I could just restate what you said from a yoga perspective. Of course. Because uh, what you said is exactly, almost verbatim, loosely translated, of course, uh, <laughs> of course. The, the opening of the Yoga Sutras. The opening of the Yoga Sutras basically says what you just said. We are born... I'm going to use this word, shall we say, with goodness, with, ah. you know, with all of the faculty to become great. And, and 
you know, when people say, well, you know, I grew up in this situation or I had these kind of parents or I had this or I had that, you know, I always look at Gandhi. Gandhi was, you know, if you blew, if you blew your breath on him, he would have fallen over. He was like so tiny. And I mean, you know, he was what some of us might call a small person and um, very frail and and yet look at what he accomplished. So we all had that seed of potential within us. Um, and what I wanted to just add to what you said, so you, you said a very profound statement and it sounds nice, um, but Patanjali addresses that in the fourth sutra. And the fourth sutra says, but you fuck, oops, sorry, I don't know if I can say that word, um, but you screwed it up. <laughs> that's, that's the essence of it. I mean, you know, we could, it's, it's said a little bit nicer, um, of course, but then he goes on to say that because we're messed up and, you know, and, and all of the great religions kind of state this in one way or another, you know, we've, we've forgotten our true essence. And so a lot of spiritual practices, therefore, are to remind us of our essence, to bring us back to the essence of who we are so that we can go back out into the world from that essence rather than from all of the Michigas. <laughs> it, it, Which, it, it, go ahead. You no, know, and, 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 and there's a beautiful Sanskrit word in my teacher taught it to me and I actually don't really pronounce it right. So if you're any of your listeners are Sanskrit, I sincerely apologize, but the word is Samaran and Samaran is this idea of remembrance. We do spiritual practice to bring us back to our wholeness. How do we do that? To remember who we really are, that we're not, you know, we're not our egos. We're not our anger. We're not our resentment. We're not our victimness. Um, that who we are is actually not all of those things, that who we are is full of incredible potential. And when we submerge our, our awareness in that place, it, it's a very empowering um, practice in that we see the world with limitless opportunities and possibilities. Let me see if you agree with, with this, because this is kind of my, this rattles around in my head a lot. So yeah. Uh, so I either need medication or something. <laughs> but, but I believe I believe that we are all born great. Yes. And then we spend the rest of our youth being told different things, creating stories around who we think we are and and who other people tell us we are. And it isn't until we get down the road a piece to when we, when we decide to ask a couple questions. The first question would be, why am I really here? And what am I really here to do? Mm -hmm. And what that means to me is I'm great, but I don't know that I'm great. So I got have to go in pursuit of my own greatness that I've forgotten over time. Because, mm -hmm. And remember who I really am and not who uh, th that six-year-old boy told me when I was six or my mother told me because she didn't know any better or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Am I even close to, to that philosophy that you subscribe to? Yeah, a lot of people um, have this idea that, you know, we're born perfect, as you said, and then, you know, through our parenting through parenting to us rather, um, through going to school, going to whatever life, uh, that it kind of messes us up, but it's, it's a lot more deeper than that. The, you know, it's kind of human engineering. Uh, we, you know, at the, at a very young age, I, I think at some point we, we have a sense of self, we have like our true self. Yeah. And, and then we, are starting to be introduced to, you know, we, we start to develop, you know, different egos. We start, start to, you know, think like, oh my God, that toy is going to make me so happy. And so that reinforces our sense of self. And then once we get that toy, we're so scared that it's going to get taken away from us, of course, until we, you know, then put our attention on something else that we must have. And if we don't, it's going to destroy us. And 
um, by God, you wouldn't know that I'm talking about children right now. You think I'm talking about most adults. You um, are. <laughs> and <laughs> so, but, but these are conditions in the human mind and in the yoga word is, is deep vasanas, these deep tendencies. Why are those tendencies there? Because we have awareness that one day we're going to die and we do everything we can to avoid it. And from a yogic perspective, uh, from a yogic philosophy perspective, that is what messes us up. It's either our own awareness of it, or we are also reinforced it by society. And so there's this constant perpetuation to have things, you know, and I think that the, I, so I don't like to necessarily say like it's society and it's culture that, that messes us up. It's also these human tendencies in the mind, these deep, you know, vasanas that we call in yoga. Um, and so unless we have skillful teachers around us at a young age, unless we have like, you know, strong spiritual practices that are, you know, guiding us, um, you know, then, then it's very easy to go down these rabbit holes of, of, you know, just keep forgetting. And so, one of the other points I wanted to bring up to Kevin, and I think it's really important, is that there is no end game when we talk about spiritual practice. Some people think, okay, if I meditate for so long, I'm going to become enlightened. Or if I if I do the spiritual practice, I'm going to become happy. You probably will become happier as a result of spiritual practice. That, I believe, is has some inevitability, but there is no end game. And so we tend to think like, oh my God, Gandhi must have been perfect. No, Gandhi actually continued his practice until the day he died. In fact, he was so steeped in his practice that when he was shot, um, uh, when somebody, <laughs> I think the, the word to use online these days, if you're being recorded live on YouTube is he was unenlightened. He was unalivened <laughs> 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 that when he was unalivened, the very last word that came out of his mouth was the word of God. And that was his practice to repeat the name of, of God, what he believed the name of God was at, you know, until that time. And that's a very important takeaway because even somebody like that practiced, um, we look to the, the teachings of Jesus, Jesus right up until his final hours continued to pray to bring his consciousness to its center. Buddha right up until the day he passed kept saying meditate and he did his practice and we look to the traditions and we look to the stories and even the gods and the, all of the saints kept doing their meditations because it's a human nature. It's our nature to forget our own essence. And so every day, no matter what level you're at of spiritual practice, um, we have to come back to remember because that tendency to develop fear, to then cling to things of life or to covet the things of life and to reinforce our sense of self, to protect our image is so deep. It's so deep. And so the only way to overcome that is to keep doing practice. And so to go back to your initial question, what does it mean to be a yogi? A yogi at a very profound level is a person that endeavors to keep that sense of remembrance of who they are and, and then also to let that essence of who they are then, you know, go out into the world. And that can be, if you, if, unless you're practicing on a regular basis, that can be very hard because we have a tendency to forget. We forget what we last remembered. <clears throat> yep. And, uh, and so it's, it's really important. Now you've been doing yep. this. Let's talk about, uh, Yogi Aaron. You've been well, doing and this. I Oh, I just ahead. want to say one I just want to say one more quick thing and I know that we agreed we'll never talk about politics and I don't want to talk about politics but a lot of people what they do then is they go on Facebook and they look for all those political stories that agree with their own perception this also then starts to reinforce the sense of self we go to hang out with people that reinforce our sense of self so we're constantly looking for that if you're a person that's practicing yoga 
not that we become necessarily dispassioned with the world events. And I know there's a lot of world events right now. It's not that I'm, I'm, I'm not compassionate or, or, or dispassionate. I am very passionate, but I'm also mindful that that's also, you know, how do I say this without getting myself in trouble? That's not part of my journey. That's someone else's karma. I've got yeah. my own karma here and part of my own karma and in, in my own dharma, my dharma means purpose, life path, is to come back and keep doing my own practice. And what does my own practice call me to do? And so it's what I'm trying to say in a, in a roundabout sort of way, it's, it's very easy for the human mind to get distracted. And I think what you just said was important. It's not an easy path. If it was easy, you know, 8 billion people would be doing it. Right. <laughs> but the practice of yoga is to keep coming back. So anyway, sorry, ask your question. <laughs> well, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a beautiful statement. And that is so true. Yeah. Um, but there comes, a, the, there's somebody in the audience is asking, okay, so where did you come from? Were you, have you always been um, this passionate about what you're doing? And have you always been searching and, and working to go in deeper with yourself and be quiet and stuff? Or were you a rabble rouser as a kid and then you had an epiphany one day? Um, is there like a D all of the above? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, well, and because the thing I want people to understand is, is that, you are a yogi and you've been working your life and you do this on a daily basis, but you're still a human being. And there still was moments in time when you were less than yogi ish. Yeah. Is that a word? I don't know. Uh, but, but I, at least I don't know that. So yeah, your backstory would be with well, you. Where did, where did you come from and where did this all begin? I, 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 <laughs> Tell me your life story in 30 seconds. Um, That's all you got. I, Wait I, a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up as a fundamentalist um, Pentecostal Christian. And so my mother was part of a Pentecostal church. I grew up in Victoria, Canada. And um, and so there's a lot that I can I can say about that experience. And But I'm not going to get into that. But I will say that that... I think laid the foundations for what it meant to be a, a person on a spiritual path. And, um, and I, I've always like, especially in my teens, my mother actually switched tracks. She went the opposite direction, got into new age. And that of course influenced uh, me a lot. My mother at the age of 14 uh, got me into doing vision boards and affirmations and, uh, you know, meditation, relaxation practices, and all of those things. I remember at the age of 15, 15 or 16, I was listening to Brian Tracy's uh, The Phoenix Seminar, you know, series, which he recorded, I think, in the late 80s. And, you know, that changed my life. Uh, that set me on a huge trajectory. And, and while I'm putting in plugs, there's one more plug I'll put in, because this this book literally changed my life. And it's it's actually one of the few books I tell people that they should read. Um, it's The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. And I, I must have read that book probably a dozen times. It I've interviewed him. Is it's a it was it changed my life. It it put me on on the path. And when I was you know, 16 years old, one of the things by doing these things I started to develop was a very strong willed mind, you know, where I put my mind, I knew that I would get there. And, and then, and then of course, once I started getting into yoga as a practice and, and quite frankly, when I got into yoga in the beginning, it was more about the workout than what it was supposed to be about the healing, the, you know, focusing your mind, learning to focus your mind and all of those sort of things came along. And then I was very lucky to have met my teacher, Rod Stryker, who uh, really started to, I always say, Rod tore the veil back between the unseen, between the seen and the unseen, between the self and the sacred. And it was through Rod that I was starting, I was able to go into that place where I could, I could penetrate, you know, below the surface, if you want to use that word. So it's, I wouldn't say that I've always been like this, but I, I do think that I 
in some way, shape or form since my teens at the very least, I have been on this path of awareness, of learning what it means to use my mind and learning how to focus my mind. And I could give you, you know, 10 life examples of that, um, especially my earlier years where that happened. But yeah, I was very blessed to have a mother that kind of push me to teach me to start learning how to use the power of my mind at a very early age. That's a, that's really cool that she made that, that fundamental switch because mm -hmm. she was, she found something lacking. This is my assumption. She mm -hmm. found something lacking in what she was doing or how it was being presented. And yeah. she wanted more. Yeah. And she wanted to learn more. And so because of that, she got into those things. I, I did the same thing. Dan Millman's book was one of the first books I've read, followed by Conversations with God, followed by mm -hmm. uh, um, Seed of the Soul, followed by um, a, a, a Journey of Souls, and and the, the list goes on, of yeah. books that were, I believe, brought to me because I asked the question, why am I really here? And they said, okay, here. We'll give you some some answers for you to go down and to figure it out. And and so I think that happens to everybody to some extent. Some people mm -hmm. choose to ignore it and to say, ah, nah. And uh, others decide that what they're doing is just fine. And others say, nah, I, I want to I want more. I want yeah. to understand more. And that's yeah, I mean, when you did when 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 most kids in their teenager years were going out partying and, you know, chasing, you know, girls or whatever, you know, young, young guys, I was, uh, <laughs> I was hanging out in the new age bookstores of Vancouver or, you know, hanging out at the spiritual healing center with my psychic, uh, Jaya, um, you know, and for me, that was a good time to speak to other, you know, share time with other people who, you know, were much older than me. Um, but also like, I was just so intrigued by that world of, Again, I just wanted to be able to tap into this world. I, I was like, the, it just completely mystified me. Um, and, and then it kind of tapered off. And then I, got, I started getting into yoga. And that's kind of what pulled me back. That process wasn't a linear line, but it eventually got me there. Ain't nothing a linear line. In this life. <laughs> no. <laughs> and and it, just as an aside... If you are sitting in your car on a Wednesday afternoon in Seattle and the traffic is terrible because it's raining outside, and um, I want you to do this. Next time you get an opportunity, go to a metaphysical bookstore or go to Barnes & Noble and go to their metaphysical section and buy the first book that speaks to you. Mm. Because somebody is asking you to buy that book and then read it. And then that will lead you. That will lead you to other things, and uh, and 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 especially to chats like we're having today with uh, Yogi Aaron. By the way, go to yogiaaron.com and you can find out all about him and all the things that he does with yoga, as well as he's developed a healing system and properties mm -hmm. that that I want to make sure that we spend some time to talk about uh, because th these hours, I got to tell you, these hours go horribly quickly for me they're like <laughs> here and then they're gone and i want to make sure we don't miss anything so uh again we're talking with yogi aaron he is in costa rica are you there now i am in costa rica i'm actually right at this moment i'm in the uh capital of costa rica which is called san jose costa rica well, that would be one that I would never get if I played Pictionary or or, what, or that <laughs> or the tr trivia that trivia game. So, um, but and you moved to Costa Rica because of that you were drawn there, were you not? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I think my yoga practice has given me more than anything else is it's kind of pushed me or nudged me in a very profound way uh, to be in purpose, to live my life purpose. And so at the moment before I moved here, I was living in, in New York City. I'd actually moved to New York. I was, I, I say it was divine inspiration. I, I ended up in New York, opened a yoga studio. Uh, and I started leading yoga retreats around the world. And of, as you do, one, one of the places was Costa Rica. And so I was driving down the road to the yoga retreat and I drove by this place on this dirt road and there was the Century 21 sign 
outside the property. And I thought, huh, it looks kind of nice. And so the long story short is I went back there with my business partner who, well, a gentleman who became my business partner. He was a student at the time. And we just decided to open up a yoga retreat. And that's how Blue Osa was born. And if somebody wants to, now you have classes there and you do, you do a lot of different things. What exactly do you do there? So if somebody wants to, I don't know, go on vacation to Costa uh-huh. Rica, what will they find when they get there? Blue Osa, to be honest with your listeners, is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible place. We're, we're located in the jungle. Uh, we're actually right next to a national park, which is called the Carcovado National Park. It's one of the crown jewels of the world uh, because, I'm not just saying that, but it's for a specific reason, 2.5, I'm going to say that again for the cheap seats in the back, 2.5% of the world's or the earth's biodiversity exists in the Corcovado National Park. And when you look at the map and you see how small it is, it's like, it, it blows you away. That, by the way, that quote comes from National Geographic. And, uh, it's just, it's amazing to me, like that we're surrounded. I blue Osa, we have two cans flying over. We have scarlet macaws. We have all these species of birds. Um, we have four species of monkeys that are sometimes around the property. Uh, and, and of course, tons of other stuff. And we're right on the beach on the ocean. And So we offer many different things. Um, I myself lead yoga teacher trainings there, yoga teacher training immersions. Um, Some are two weeks, some are four weeks. Um, I also lead uh, uh, pain-free yoga retreats. And and then we also have a lot of other yoga teachers. There's actually a yoga teacher. I don't remember the name of the studio right now, but her name is Tracy. And Tracy's going to come and lead a retreat. Um, she's Her studio is in Kirkland. And she's coming to lead a retreat with us in April. So if anybody is interested, they can contact me for more information. But we have a lot of different yoga teachers that come and bring people on retreats there. And then for people that just want to come on vacation... Uh, they can also do that as well. We have incredible packages that include these beautiful rainforest tours. Um, they can come for spa, you know, a spa week. We have these spa packages where you get a spa service every single day in our rainforest spa. And uh, we have like other things that people can do. So there's a little something for everybody. I got to ask you a question because I I don't know the answer to this. There was a gal that went to a place like Costa Rica for mm-hmm. a month. Yeah, her name was Melanie Litton. I don't know if you know that name or uh, if she was at your retreat, but mm-hmm. but if it was, she described it as being a life changing experience. Nothing less yeah. than a life changing experience. Yeah, I I mean that's I I. I don't know if it was her that came. I'd have to go back. We've had thousands of people come, you know, to our place, (laughs) but it's quite possible. And, um, I, what I can tell you is, well, there's two sides of it. The first side is our property, our space. It just, you just get removed from everything and, and all you're left with is nature. And in, in both the yogic teachings, the Buddhist teachings, and Christian teachings, they say if you need to feel restored, go to nature. You know, we look to, you know, all of the, the, the greats that, you know, they took time away and they went to nature. And that's what coming to Blue Osa is, is you have minimal uh, internet. You know, we don't have internet in all the rooms. We don't have TVs. Um, so when you strip all of that stuff away, there's just nature and you get to be fully saturated in nature. Um, a ritual that we always invite our guests to do because at Blue Osa, we practice morning silence. Um, and we practice morning silence until seven 30 in the mornings. So guests wake up when they wake up. It's usually around five 30. They go get their tea or coffee or water And they go to the beach and they watch the sunrise in silence. And all you can hear is the sound of the ocean, the uh, trees rustling in the wind, the birds singing. 
And there's something that's profound. It, it helps people to, again, yoga, go back to the source. And when we go back to the source, we restore ourselves in that still place. You know, there's a beautiful quote from Psalms that says, be still and know that I'm God. And so when we're able to go to that place of stillness, we're able to be saturated, you know, in our own, you know, authentic self, if you want to use that word. Um, so I would say it's one part Costa Rica <laughs> or Blue Osa, and then one part, you know, all the yoga, um, eating healthy food, being cared for by people that genuinely care about you, um, and then taking time for yourself and also stripping away a little bit of social media. <laughs> you know, there, in our society, there are, there are people, no TV, there's, there's, there's there's no TV in the room and there's no internet. It's like life is over. Yeah. Uh, but, but at the same time, if you can be quiet. <laughs> yes. and, and I tell, I tell people this a lot if they, to start their day, if they're going to work and stuff, when you step outside of your house, after you're all dressed and all ready and you're going to go to work, stand outside of your, and just stand there and mm -hmm. just be quiet. Listen to the wind, listen to the birds, listen to the traffic, listen to all the things around you, and your day will change. It'll change mm -hmm. how you perceive life to be around you. Is is that true? Absolutely. Um, it's it's as I said. It's it's that coming back to that Psalms. You know, be still and know that I'm God. Mother Teresa also said something very profound. She said, God speaks and the heart listens. Um, and so what that, what they're saying essentially is like, we're so distracted again, being consumed with what do I want? I want, I want, I want, or I'm guarding, guarding, I'm protecting, I have to preserve. And so there's this, most of us are operating out of fear. We're going, you know, through life constantly distracted. And once we strip all of that away, there's nothing left to put our attention to except what's inwards. And that scares the heck out of a lot of people. But what I constantly find is that the people just kind of let go and listen for a moment. Most of the time, if not all the time, I would say, they actually find that reservoir of deep contentment. Uh, within and they're able to hear the calling of the heart but the calling isn't a loud noise it's it's spoken in the whispers of silence and uh, so in order for us to do that we have to get still but do you find that as you practice and as you work through the uh, silence and the things that you do that that voice gets louder and the other voice gets smaller yeah yeah, I, I mean, but it also comes up in different ways. Um, the more practice we do, the more we're able to pay attention, to understand, to hear, uh, to discern. Um, I told you earlier that I, I kind of moved to New York through divine intervention. And, you know, I was actually living my best life. I was, I was around 27, 28 at the time. And I had this job on Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Um, I was very fortunate because uh, at that time I worked in the aquatics department and I was stationed in two places. I was stationed in Haiti in the resort in Haiti where the ships came. And then I was also re uh, stationed on a small little island called Little Stirrup Cay um, in, in the Berry Islands of the Bahamas. So I kind of went back and forth. But I remember living in Haiti and... Um, and our compound was so beautiful and it was right on the ocean. And I would grab my yoga mat and go down and practice by the ocean on the water. And I just like, I, this is just the best life. But this, this idea started to stir in me, which was very interesting. You know, you're not meant to be here. You're meant to go somewhere else. And, and I kind of just started to sit with it for the longest time. And I, that's kind of what started to move me to go to New York. It was like, you're not meant to be here in paradise. You're meant to go and teach other people yoga. So that's what kind of led me to New York. I literally 
took out a map and my finger landed on New York. <laughs> and I was like, okay, guess I'm going to New York. <laughs> now that takes a, and, and uh, a lot of courage to be able to, especially when you were, you know, in paradise and you were on a cruise ship mm -hmm. and you were doing all this really cool stuff. And then, but you were following your heart and yeah. you were living your passion. And that is, that is, that is, that is absolutely how I believe that we should all be living our lives. And so few of us actually follow that path and get that done. A lot of us get stuck in, in what we think we, you know, is supposed to be our life or what we think we, sh you know, we're entitled to, or what we think we should have. I mean, here I was, you know, and remember I told you, my mother got me doing these vision boards. Um, yes. And one of those things on the vision boards was, you remember back in the eighties, there was the club med, uh, advertisement oh, yes. oh, hands yeah. up, baby <laughs> hands up. <laughs> no, yeah. but th that is etched in my, my mind. And so I used to kind of like have that on my vision board. I used to dream and, and you got to put things into context. I used to live in Northern Canada, the furthest thing away from the ocean when I started doing this, you know, it was like Arctic tundra. Um, and so the idea of me living, you know, a stone throw away from the ocean was like, are you kidding? I actually made it. And, but yet part of being in practice is also being aware of like, we go where spirit tells us to go. We go where the heart is is asking us to go. And sometimes it says New York City. And you're like, what the F are you telling me this for? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but I did. And that like literally, you know, opened up a universe of so many experiences and possibilities that, you know, led me to the rest of my life. Um, and, and so it's really important that we're in tune with that. And I wouldn't say that doors open as a result of us doing practice. I think that doors are always opening, but doing practice allows us to see the doors that are opening and then gives us the confidence to walk through the doors, you know, the fearless, the fearlessness to take that step into the unknown. So practice has two things, you know, to see the doors, you know, most people always complain or, or comment like, oh, they're not lucky. And, you know, I always say luck has had nothing to do with my life. I just saw doors open and I was through it. <laughs> you did an amazing job of doing that. So many people don't. So many people yeah. don't. And in, in fact, the reason that you are here right now on KKNW, 1150 AM in Seattle on Wednesday at 446 in the afternoon is because I had that same dream. Yeah. This was, and I had no idea how or when or what it was going to happen, how it was going to come to fruition. I just knew that I, I had an idea uh, that I, what I wanted to do and it has progressed and doors have opened and yes, some doors have closed. Some yeah, relationships sure. started, some relationships went away and in, including my bad country music song period, which we all have from time to time. And, <laughs> but I will, but I will tell you, Yogi, it is the adventure of a lifetime when yeah. you can be open to it and to go follow your heart and do what, you know, you're not going to be here forever. So no. don't waste it. Be here and, and be clear about, about who you are and what you're after. Uh, we're going to run out of time. I've got to talk to you about your uh, revolutionary new way of, to practice yoga. And it is why am I, why, why am I, what, what I is get Ayama. <laughs> now I got it. Ayama. <laughs> and it is a way for people to, practice yoga and also you also help people feel better and mm -hmm. to get rid of pain through yes. this whole process that you've developed i'm going to shut up and you talk about it <laughs> thank you <laughs> well the very sh quick story because i know that we're running out of time yeah, we got the 13 very, minutes so you're good the, the the very quick story is that i 
got into yoga actually because I was really tight in my body and I just felt like I should stretch. So I started stretching. Um, just kind of worthwhile mentioning it was around 18 years old. I was around 18 years old. And one of the things that happened to me like right out of the gate was I hurt my back really badly. And that had never happened to me before. But my lower back seized up on me. And so what did I do? I did more yoga, aka stretching. And I started going to different yoga teachers. And they told me my back problems were because my back was too tight. My hamstrings were too tight. And so I stretched more and I suffered from more chronic pain. Um, I'm not going to get into that whole story, but for the next 25 years, I kind of went in and out of dealing with severe chronic pain. Uh, one of the kinds of chronic pain that I had was in my back, in my hips, but I also suffered from chronic pain in my neck. Um, so what did I do? I stretched more. <laughs> I, about 25 years later, I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital with an orthopedic surgeon telling me that I was going to need a spinal fusion in my lower back. I then went to the drawing board, went back to school, and I learned what I was doing wrong. This is the easy, you know, quick answer um, or what I needed to change. And what I quickly realized was that stretching was actually causing more problems uh, than actually helping. And so one of the things that I also realized is that yoga actually has nothing to do with stretching. Um, I, you know, nowhere in the yoga scriptures <laughs> does it say anything about flexibility or stretching. Uh, oh, that's good. Kind of, then I can, I can practice it then. <laughs> you can definitely practice it. Um, and so, but being a person who teaches asana, asana is like doing the postures, I kind of had to go back to school and understand, okay, well, what are we actually doing and what is it that we want to do? And that kind of journey took me into this world of muscle activation. And so how I healed myself and how I not ended up having a spinal fusion after all of these years is that my, I focus on doing muscle activation instead. And that's, that's the kind of like short answer. Uh, to all of this. And so what is muscle activation? Muscle activation, I told you I could interview myself. You can. Uh, <laughs> muscle activation is, is basically re-establishing the neuromuscular connection between the nervous system and the muscles. And so the reason why we start to develop tight muscles is that the muscles are shutting down in the body and so there's the, the result is instability, and that instability um, causes muscle tightness. And that muscle tightness is actually exacerbating that neuromuscular connection. So the basically the communication system between the brain and the muscles. So if you can imagine like a telephone line between the two. And so what muscle activation is, is like the repairman uh, coming to fix the telephone line. You know, sometimes it gets a little frayed, a little loose. They come in, they tighten everything up. They make sure the connection's good. They bring it from that staticky, you know, connection. Hello, hello, can you hear me? To, yes, we have 100% clarity. There's 100% communication. And I don't know the demographics of your listeners, but you know, you and I are both of of an older persuasion, and um, probably not the best word to use, but we're older and we're more experienced. We're more we're more refined. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and Yogi, I'll I'll tell you that uh, my audience is sixty five percent women, thirty five percent men in their in, between thirty and sixty. Okay, so. One of the things that a lot of your audience members can relate to is as we get older, things don't work well and we blame <laughs> it on age yeah. and, else, and we also blame it on, you know, muscle deterioration. Well, why is that happening? It's happening because that connection between the brain and the muscles is becoming weaker and through muscle activation, we get it stronger. And that is, uh, 
that really is a an interesting point because when you look at your nerves and your muscles and if your muscles get too tight and and then your nerves can spasm and if your nerves spasm it can cause uh everything to kind of freeze up and becomes kind of a uh, so you really need to the muscles to be fluid the the uh um nerves to have a way so this the, to to my way of thinking this makes perfect sense because i've i've been in going to chiropractor since the mid 80s and it's all about um not flexibility necessarily but muscle relaxation and mm -hmm. and having does that is that kind of does that kind of sum it up a little bit yeah, it when we look at what's go, what a chiropractor do, does to use that example, they're basically reestablishing a communication system where muscle activation is a little bit different than what chiropractors do because they're looking at what's going on in the spine and and right. helping that. But what we're doing is we're literally going in to reestablish a communication between the brain and the muscles. And so what's interesting is the short answer is how does it actually work? There's a few different ways. There's there's a couple of different techniques, but one is by bringing the muscle actively into a shortened state. How do we do that? By isometrically contracting the muscle. And by doing that a few different times, we start to reestablish that, that brain to muscle connection. Um, actually my friend literally just before I got on the show with you is here visiting me and he just had an appendix surgery and, and anybody who knows what, you know, th that is, they cut right into the abdominal wall and, and through different muscles. And, it, and so on that side of the body, it can become very compromised. Well, what does the body do? It tightens up and restricts movement. And so from a muscle activation perspective, we don't want to go out and move the body in a way that's going to stress it out more because that's actually going to cause more problems. But we do need to start reactivating those muscles. And so it was interesting because I had him do this one thing where he was trying to lift his leg, you know, he was on his stomach and he bends the knee and lifts one leg up. He couldn't do it. So we just started backing away and I was like, okay, well, keep the leg straight. Do like lift lift the leg like a quarter of an inch off the ground and really tighten your glute up. Okay, I can do that. There's no pain. Okay, let's repeat that a few more times. Then I had him re-bend the knee and then lift the leg up again. And he did it. No pain. And so what was going on was before he was using a different part of his body, aka his core, to lift his leg up, which was the wrong muscles. But by doing the muscle activation, we got him his brain to start reconnecting to his glutes, which is the muscles that he was supposed to be using in the first place. So what we're doing in muscle activation is reconnecting the telephone line between the brain and the muscles. And we're getting as specific as possible. When we, when the brain isn't connected to the muscles properly, it recruits other muscles. Then it starts to put stress on those muscles um, with a lot of people, for example, they end up with severe back pain. That's because all the muscles in the back aren't connected properly. And so when the body needs those muscles to work, they don't work. And, and the definition of muscle that works properly is a muscle that can contract and contract on demand. When it doesn't, the result is um, inflammation and stress and trauma to other joints of the body. Uh, and so that's where we come in, in, in muscle activation. So now let me ask you, if somebody wanted to talk to you about that, can you do this remotely? Can you do this by talking somebody through it? Absolutely. I can do it. I mean, if somebody wants to book a uh, time with me, I can definitely do that. Um, I can also refer people to muscle activations, uh, people in, in their area, um, but what I would also recommend is that people go to my website, which you've graciously given a few times, yogiaron.com. And right there, people can access all kinds of uh, lessons with me online and learn more about what I'm doing and also, you know, access their own pain-free journey and learn how they can get out of pain. I'm looking at your website right now. It is worth going to. I, I got to tell you because you've got YouTubes and all kinds of stuff. So spend some Thank time you. there. 
I want to thank you, Yogi Aaron, for being here. I really appreciate it. And by the way, your podcast, real quick. Yes. Um, my podcast is called Stop Stretching. And also people can get a copy of my book and it's also called Stop Stretching. <laughs> All right, it's easy. So everybody stop stretching and use muscle activation and that'll that'll work a whole lot better. I've got 20 seconds. Give me a piece of wisdom. Repeat to yourself every single morning when you wake up five times. I am opening myself up to the universe of limitless possibilities and say it or say it, keep saying it until you actually feel it resonating and uh, harmonizing in your heart. That's perfect. And if you need to review that, you can go back to this episode, which is going to be online on YouTube. It's going to be there right now. And by the way, everybody, thank you for being here and be kind to one another because each other's all we've got. We'll see you Friday at noon.